Hey, I'm Pastor Mike, and I am so glad that you're here with me for our digital broadcast for Good Hope Church. Uh, I want to let you know a couple things before we get going. First of all, uh, this is a communion service, so if you would like to receive communion with me, if you're comfortable doing that, I'll go ahead and gather some communion elements. We'll receive Holy Communion at the end of the service. If you would like some of these self-contained communion cups, uh, we can mail some out. And uh, just shoot me an email, pastormike at goodhope.ag, and I'll make sure that you get some communion elements. Uh, be very excited to have you participate with us in Holy Communion. Then I want to let you know about our website, goodhope.ag. Got all kinds of information on there, uh, all the bulletin information, everything that's going on uh, in person, and everything you can participate with online right there on the website. So now... Let's go ahead and take some time for worship. We have our, our song time in the service, and what this is designed to do is just to help us love God. So we want to let go of all the worries and cares we have, uh, all the things going on, and we just want to focus on loving God because the greatest commandment is to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And just like if you don't take time to be thankful, thankfulness isn't going to just bubble up. But if you look around and you, you take time to be thankful for the different things in your life, then you're going to grow in your thankfulness. And if you never take any time to honor and love God, then, you know, loving God is going to be something that fades away in your life. So in our song service now, let's take some time. Let's worship the Lord. Let's love our God.
praise your name, Lord, for all that you've done and all that you're yet to do. We worship you. You are worthy.
good to worship the Lord. Amen. Amen. Well, hey, this is Labor Day weekend. And so for our one minute blessing, let's pray for workers. You know, every service we pray together, because when God's people pray, it moves the hand of God and it changes the heart of the people who pray. Let me tell you, uh, people who are working hard need to be valued. And then also we need more people. I mean, uh, society-wide, there are labor shortages. And so let's pray blessings over people who are working hard. And let's also pray that uh, that there would be more workers that would come, that people would come and, and serve our society in that way. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this Labor Day weekend. And uh, we thank you for our workers. Lord, we pray your blessings on each one. And the Lord, that you would uh, just encourage and strengthen those who are working hard in our society, who are carrying the load. And so, Father, we pray your blessings upon them. And also, Lord, uh, when there's labor shortages, we pray, Lord, that you would provide people. You'd provide people who could come and who could serve in a vocation in a, in a good way, who would get paid well, and it would all work out well for everybody. So, Lord, we lift up our workers on this Labor Day weekend. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. Well, hey, Labor Day weekend. That means it's the end of the summer and we're finishing up our summer series. Uh, our summer series we've called The New Life. And this is the last week. Uh, we've been talking about how Jesus changed the world 2,000 years ago with two words. And those words were, follow me. Jesus called people to follow him. And some people did. Some people left their fishing nets. Uh, they left their businesses, they left their cushy government jobs at the tax collector's booth, and they came and they they followed Jesus. And what that means is they actually like followed him around. Like when he went walking around and went to different places, they went with him. And now, how do we follow Jesus? How does that work? We've covered a whole bunch of things throughout this whole thing. Uh, we started the series with talking about being born again. Then we talked about counting the costs talked about walking by faith, then living right. Our uh, Father's Day weekend was man up. We talked about forgiveness. We talked about being a citizen of heaven, how we relate to church, water baptism, Holy Spirit baptism, prayer, learning how to hear from God, spiritual gifts. The fruit of the Spirit last week was giving, and now we finish it up with the last uh, installment of the series that we're calling Finally Surrendering to God. So this is the last uh, sermon in the series, and we're calling it Finally Surrendering to God, something that we need to grab hold of on our life of, of following Jesus, walking with Christ, is finally, fully surrendering to God. So let's pray, and we'll get into that here today. So Heavenly Father, thank you for your holy scriptures. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you, Father, that uh, that you don't leave us here just to guess and to wander around and, you know, try to poll our friends on what we should do. But Lord, you guide us by your Holy Spirit and you guide us by your Holy Word. And Father, I pray you'd bring your Word to life right now, that you'd speak to our hearts, that you'd give us all something good. We all need something different. We all need a different breakthrough. We all need something from you, Lord. And so, Father, I pray by your Spirit, you would give that to each one of us. As we seek you, Lord, please give us something good. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, many people come to believe in Jesus. They come to serve to some extent. They're trusting in God, but there's something missing that's not quite all the way there. And that thing that's missing is fully surrendering to God. That's what's missing. Christian people can be living in the tension between, you know, knowing what they should do, but holding back from God. There's a tension there that is caused by holding back from God. You can feel it. You walk in it. It's not so good. So we don't want to be in that place 
where we're holding back from God. We want to fully surrender to God. And people can hold back all kinds of different things from God. They can hold back, you know, things they know God has for them to do. Maybe they have a calling on their life and they don't want to do it. So they're holding back from God. Maybe there's a a, a sacrifice, an offering, something they're supposed to do in their life that's going to be difficult and they don't want to do that. Maybe they're holding a grudge against somebody and they know God wants them to forgive they can't do it. You know, they're holding back from God. There's all these different ways that people hold back from God. And we don't want to do that. We want to fully surrender to God. And as we're talking about this, I want to look at something that Jesus is recorded as, as saying six different times in the Gospels. The Gospels are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the first four books of the New Testament. These are the life and teachings of Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And in the Gospels, Jesus says something very similar six different times. And just to give you just a a, a feeling for how significant that is, you know, the virgin birth only made two of the Gospels. You know, (laughs) the virgin birth is in Matthew and Luke, but not in Mark or John. Uh, You must be born again is only in John, not in Matthew, Mark, or Luke. So this teaching that Jesus gives is in them six times. That means it's in all four and in two of them twice. So this is a significant teaching. Now, I believe the Bible only has to say something once for it to be true. But if it's in there six times, then that means that there's an emphasis and that we probably should be able to figure it out without misinterpretation. You know, if something's only in one spot, you know, maybe you can use it out of context and get kind of confused and and run off over here. This is in here six different times. So let's take a look at it. I'm going to read all six because I want that to kind of, I want it to settle in on us. Like this is in here over and over. It's something God does not want us to miss because it's in the gospels six different times. So Matthew 10, 39 is the basic idea. Here we go. Matthew 10, 39, whoever finds their life will lose it and whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. Whoever finds their life will lose it, and whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. Very counterintuitive claim. Like, if you want to find your life, you know, find out who you are, go follow your dreams, you want to go become who you want to be, Jesus says if you find that, you're going to lose your life, but if you give up your life for his sake, for Jesus' sake, for the kingdom of God, then you're actually going to find it. You're going to get your life by giving it up. Instead of trying to grab hold of your life, when you release your life to God, then you actually get to grab hold of your life. So that's an amazing, amazing thing to say. Let's read the context here. Context, just a couple verses ahead of time. Let's start in verse 37. Again, we're in Matthew chapter 10. Anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds their life will lose it, and whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. So what is Jesus saying here? He's saying he needs to be the number one priority. God first. The uh, Good Hope Church is an assembly of God church. When I go to pastor's trainings and stuff like that, they say, you got three major priorities and make sure you get them in the right order. It's God, then it's family, then it's ministry. Make sure you get that in the right order is what they tell me. Because if you don't have God first, the other two aren't going to work. And if you don't have your family working, ministry is going to fall apart too. So it's got to be God, family, and then ministry. That's what they tell me. I believe it. What Jesus is saying here is it's God first. Follow Jesus first. It can't be any other way. We'll just go forward to chapter 16 of Matthew. 16, we'll read 24 through 26, and it's the same basic message. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? Here, Jesus very much bringing the, uh, the future, like, you don't want to live this life 
and have it all go well, but you lose eternity. Like you don't want that. That's that's a bad deal. Here we go. Mark chapter 8, 34 through 36. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples. So Jesus is speaking to big brunch people. And he said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Very similar uh, statement there in Mark 8. Now, Luke 9, 23 and 24. Luke 9, 23 and 24. Then he said to them all, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will save it. So that's a big one. Same concept. Luke 17, 31 through 35. I like the way it's phrased here. There's a, a little extra bonus here in Luke 17, starting in verse 31. On that day, no one who is on the housetop with possessions inside should go down uh, to get them. Likewise, no one in the field should go back for anything. Remember Lot's wife. Whoever tries to keep their life will lose it, and whoever loses their life will preserve it. I tell you, on that night, two people will be in bed. One will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding grain together. One will be taken and the other left. So that is clearly talking about end times things. It's talking about how we don't want to keep this world and then forfeit the next. Very important. Let's go back to chapter 9. I missed a verse there in chapter 9. We're going to read uh, verse 25 as well in Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9, verse 25 you know, we read the whole verse 24, for whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit their very self? That verse 25 is quite interesting because what it's saying there is that you can be successful in the eyes of the world, but you know you're not being true to who you are. And we don't want to miss that. You know, maybe you've accomplished a lot, but you're not true to who you are. You're really living the wrong life. You feel like you've, you've stepped into the wrong sorts of things. And, and that's not something that we want either. We don't want to lose our very self. We don't want to lose our afterlife, but we don't want to lose what we've got here either. Then we'll go to John 12. You know, finish up reading these examples, 24 through 26 of John 12. And it says, very truly, I tell you, Unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. My Father will honor the one who serves me. So, Jesus very clearly over and over here is talking about if you lose your life in order to serve the Lord, that then you're going to gain something way more than what you gave up. So we have to give up our lives to serve Jesus. However, what we get in return is way better. Jesus expects his disciples to give up their lives and follow him. If you give up your life to serve Jesus, you'll actually find your life now and forever. If you try to keep your life, if you're going to be all selfish about this and you're going to just cling to things, then you're going to lose it now and forever. So, six times. Try to keep your life, you're going to lose it. You give up your life, you're going to gain it. Set in different ways, six different times. If you truly believe that, what would you do? What would your actions be? How would that show in your life? If you truly believe that, what would your life be like? Again, too many Christians live in the tension of knowing what they should do, but they're still holding back from God. They know they're supposed to give up their lives to follow Christ, but they're holding some things back. You know, everybody wants to give up their afterlife. Lord, I give you my afterlife, but I want to keep this life for myself and do what I want. That's not what Jesus says. You know, take up your cross daily. 
You know, don't put your family in front of God. Like these are some pretty strong words. We've got to give up our lives, and that means 100%. So Christians live in this tension of knowing that they should fully release, fully surrender to God, but it's scary. You know, people hold back. Why? I got two major reasons. One is practical obstacles. It seems too hard. It's too painful. There's things God wants me to give up that I just, I don't know that I can give up. There's, there's a, a money I see as security, and I don't want to have to give up money. Some people, I tried. I gave God everything I could give. It didn't really seem to work. I mean, I know he's there, and I know he's good, but it didn't seem to go anywhere. You know, I don't want to have to move to Africa. You know, I've had a lot of people tell me that. I serve God completely, but I don't want to move to Africa. Well, God's probably not asking you to go to Africa. There's burnout. You know, like you served God for a long time. You gave probably too much and, and burned yourself out. That's understandable. I understand that. You know, those practical obstacles can be a big hindrance. It can be a big challenge. We don't want to, though, miss the good things that God is offering. Remember, Jesus said, if you give up your life, you'll gain it. That's what you want. You want to grab hold of your life. It's time now, understanding that these practical obstacles are real and they're daunting. Let's make sure that we put faith and wisdom to work. Sometimes it's a lack of faith. Sometimes it's a lack of wisdom. Talk a little bit more uh, when we talk about taking this too far. So, Let's read 1 John 5, 3, and 4, just to get a feel for how we should look at this. In fact, this is love for God, to keep his commands. And his commands are not burdensome, for everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Look what the Bible says. His commands are not burdensome. That means that it's not hard to follow Jesus. It's not hard to fully surrender your life to Christ. If we love God, then we keep his commands. His commands are not burdensome because we have the power to overcome the world by faith. And so let's put some faith on it and trust the Lord. But again, it takes wisdom, wisdom and faith. If you're dealing with these practical obstacles, then let's just just lean in to faith and lean in to wisdom. There's also some religious obstacles. Uh, That can be a problem. I'm not going to go super deep here, but, you know, there can be bad combinations of unrealistic expectations, you know, religious expectations put on people that are just unreasonable. There's defeatist theologies. You know, I hear people, well, we all sin thousands of times every day. Like, what? You know, the Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But, hey, guess what? We're here to get the victory. Defeatist theologies are not helpful. And then there's religious pride. What? You know, there's many forms of that stuff, of course, but it can be a mess. It, it messes with the individual and can push people away. You know, if you're dealing with a religious environment that has unrealistic expectations, that really has a defeatist theology that's telling you, you know, like you're always going to fail, you don't want that. And especially if there's pride in there, I don't even understand how that works. You know, like, Yep, uh, destined to fail all the time, but I sure am better than everyone else. Like, what? It, it doesn't even make sense. You know, okay, you've memorized the book of Romans. I don't care. Don't be prideful. It doesn't even make any sense. So, you know, unrealistic expectations, religious expectations, defeatist theology, and pride is a mess. I want to read First Peter 5, 5 and 6. It says this, In the same way, you who are younger, submit yourselves to your elders. All of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another because God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time. Humble yourselves. Our job is to be humble. I heard a preacher one time say, our job is to be humble. God's job is to lift us up. If we do God's job, he'll do our job. If we want to lift ourselves up, he'll humble us. But it says here, God opposes the proud. So if you want to be opposed by God, then go ahead and stay prideful. But that's not going to work, is it? 
opposed by God. How are you going to do? You're going to win that battle? If you're opposed by God, it's just not going to work. And this religious mess where you've got this bad combination of unrealistic expectations, the defeatist theology and pride, you know, that religious pride mixed with that stuff turns into idolatry, either idolatry for self or idolatry of your Christian brand, and that isn't going to work. So we need to release all of that. We need to lay it all down at the feet of Jesus and say, I'm, I'm letting all of this go. I'm dying to all of this. I want to follow you. So let's just make sure that this point is made clear. However, if we actually succeed at releasing our life to God, giving up our lives for the sake of Christ, if we succeed in that, we understand what that actually means, we go ahead and do it. If we do that, we finally fully surrender to God, then the promise is that we gain our life, not that we lose it. The promise is that we have good things. Let's go to Mark 10. 28 through 30. This is the story of the rich young ruler. And it's a situation where this guy seems pretty awesome. He wants to find out what he needs to do to inherit eternal life. Jesus says, you know, follow all the rules. He's like, man, I've been following them forever. And this dude is doing really well. So Jesus invites him to be one of his disciples. He says, hey, and go sell your stuff and come follow me. And the dude's like, no, I got a lot of stuff. I'm keeping my stuff. So he leaves. And it's a clear indication of someone who would not do what we've been talking about. He, he wanted to save his life. He wanted to keep his life. And so he lost God's plan for his life. And that doesn't work out well for people. But Peter is like, hey, you know, we left our fishing nets. We left our business. You know, Matthew left his tax collector's booth. We left everything to follow you. What, what, what for us then? Let's pick it up. Verse 28. Then Peter spoke up. We have left everything to follow you. Truly I tell you, Jesus replied, no one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me and the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age, homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and fields, along with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. So an incredible, incredible promise, not just that you get eternal life, but in this age, a hundred times as much. That's fantastic. Now, I could say a lot about that. I asked God about that one time. What's this hundredfold return thing? What's that look like? You know, because I'm not, I doubt I'm going to end up with a hundred houses. But here's what God showed me. And some people, it's, it's maybe more along those lines. But God just spoke to my heart, you know, how many homes are you welcome in? I'm welcome. I'm welcome in more than a hundred. That's cool. You know, I bet there's some of you out there. If I found myself in a rough spot, you'd take me in and let me sleep on the couch. Right. I mean, it's cool. We get to grab hold of something much, much more beautiful than what we let go of. So talking about fully surrendering to God and I've been, you know, I've been kind of hitting that pretty hard. But is it possible to take that too far? Is it possible to overswing? Is it possible to miss it? And I would submit to you, yes. It's not really possible to give yourself up too much to God, but you can give up things God isn't asking you to give up. You can go in the wrong direction thinking you're sacrificing your life for Christ, but you're just making up your own thing and doing it wrong. So we can miss the mark on this. I think there are people who who respond to this like how Peter did. We're going back to Peter. He likes to ask the questions. We're going to go to John chapter 13. And Peter asks a fantastic question. Uh, I'm sorry. This He just did ask a fantastic question. In this case, he's in a situation where he's not trusting Jesus. He's not fully surrendering to Jesus. But then when he finally does, he overshoots it. So it's a really interesting example. So let's go to John 13. We're going to read verses 6 through 10. And this is the situation where Jesus is washing his disciples' feet on the, the last day, the, like at the uh, Last Supper, you know, that day. He's washing his disciples' feet. So we pick it up, verse 6. 
he came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Just a quick side note. Whenever Jesus says something to you, the correct answer isn't no. (laughs) The correct answer is, okay, yes, help me understand, that sort of thing. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. So Jesus is getting stern here. He's like, hey, I'm going to wash your feet, all right? Then Lord Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Verse 10, Jesus answered, those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean, and you are clean, though not every one of you. So, you you won't wash my feet. Jesus says, unless I wash your feet, you got no part with me. Okay, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. She's like, no, I just want to wash your feet. So Peter is like, you can't wash anything. Jesus is like, I want to wash your feet. He's like, no, He's like, I'm going to wash your feet. Well, feet, hands, head. She's like, no, just your feet. Not nothing, not feet, hands, feet, hands, and head, just feet. See how Peter overshot that. He overshot submitting to Jesus saying, you know, I need to wash your feet. He overshot it. And so when it comes to like laying your life down to serve Jesus, can we overshoot that? Is that possible? I think, I think we can. I think we can swing past it, end up in this place where God didn't want us in the first place. And then we realize that there's bad things there. So then we swing back to holding back from God and realize there's not some such great things there. So then we'll overcompensate and miss it again over here and can be swinging back and forth. And that's no good. You know, uh, it's sort of like, you know, when you were a kid, food that was good for you wasn't the food you wanted to eat. You know, like, so then you could get into this thought of like, well, if it doesn't taste good, it's probably good for me. Or if it tastes good, it's probably bad for me. Well, that's absolutely not true. You know, there is food that is, very good for you that tastes awesome. You ever pick a fresh strawberry that's in the sunlight and it's just warm and oh, my mouth is watering just thinking about it right now. A fresh picked strawberry is very good for you. You know, there's lots of food that's good for you. I love Brussels sprouts. I'm a huge fan. It's good for you. A lot of people don't like them. I don't understand it because they're awesome. But a lot of food that's good for you actually tastes good. And a lot of stuff that's bad for you tastes bad. And so you don't want to get into that mentality of thinking all food that tastes bad is good for me and all food that tastes good is bad for me. You don't want to get into that uh, taking it too far. And people can get like that with laying their lives down before God, giving their lives up. They can think, well, if it stinks, if it's horrible, if it's miserable and I don't want to do it, it must be God's will. Uh, if I want to do it, if it's fun, if it makes me happy, God must be against it. And you can take it too far. But don't forget, again, a hundredfold return. Like God's not wanting to ruin our lives. He's wanting to give us our lives better. So we want to grab hold of that. We don't want to fall into that all sacrifice, no blessing mentality that if it's terrible, it must be God's will. The truth is we want to walk in the blessings of God as we live in a sacrificial lifestyle of serving God. So here's an important question I want to ask you. Can you ever really give up? Heard a preacher named Keith Moore preach on this? Brilliant. Can you ever really give up? Can you ever really serve enough? Can you ever really read your Bible enough? Can you ever really pray enough? The answer is absolutely yes. You can serve enough, you can give enough, you can pray enough, you can read your Bible enough. Now, maybe you're not, and you got to check your heart on that one, but you can. You can absolutely serve enough, pray enough, sacrifice enough, give enough to be in the center of God's will in your life. You know, it's just unrealistic. It's that, going back to that unre- unreasonable religious expectations. Well, you never can give enough. 
Well, can you outgive what Jesus did on the cross? Well, no. But God's not asking you to do that. Can you earn your salvation? No, God's not asking you to do that. You can do exactly what God wants you to do. I've had times where I've given too much. I've had times where I've given too little. And you can feel where that sweet spot is. I've had times where I've given things up that God hasn't asked me to give up. I mean, I read the thing about, you you know, you got to love me more than your family. So, I mean, if, if there was a Bible study I could go to with three people, I'd skip my kid's Christmas program. I mean, like, for sure. That's wrong. <laughs> I misinterpreted that. I should have set a t- aside uh, that time for family and said, hey, man, can't make it to the Bible study. I should have done that. I didn't do it. I sacrificed things I didn't need to sacrifice. I, I swung too far. Now I'm learning, okay, where is that sweet spot? Where is the right place to be? You can give enough. You can serve enough. You can pray enough. You can sacrifice enough to be in the center of God's will. You got to find out if you're actually there or not. If we go too far, if we swing too far in this, then you can open yourself up to the toxic fear that you're never good enough for God. How's that going to work with your relationship with God when you think you're constantly failing, you're never good enough, you're always wrong, you're always bad, you're always failing. That's not good for your relationship with God. What you should do is pray, like we talked about last week, pray, seek the Lord on what you should give and give that, and then rest in the Lord. I am giving what God has shown me to give, and now you're done with it. You can do the same thing with your prayer life. Lord, how do you want me to pray? How often, you know, do you have time frames for that? Or is it, how do you want me to do that? You seek the Lord. And then if the Lord is like, you know, take 15 minutes every morning to specifically pray for your family and coworkers or other people at school, you know, like, and then throughout the day, whenever it makes sense, go ahead and pray and be like, okay, I'll do that. Well, then guess what? Now you're in the center of God's will. And maybe later on, God changes that. He's like, okay, I want you to pray for two hours today. You're like, okay. You know, like you just, you can pray enough. But if God has 15 minutes for you and you pray for an hour, you're going to get wore out and you're going to hate prayer. That's not helpful. So if you miss it too far, then you end up, you know, open to this toxic fear that you're never good enough for God and they can get worse. It can open you up to tolerating and accepting spiritual abuse. Like you can end up in under leadership that is abusive to you and you're pretty sure you're terrible anyway. And so you just accept it. That's not where you want to be. If we miss it on the other side, if we're holding back from God, then that means then you're going to miss God's plan for your life. And that's no good. But worse than that, there's, there's a ripple effect to that. If you're a father, that means your kids are going to have a father who's not living God's plan for his life, and that's going to affect them. If you're an employer, it's going to affect your employees. If you're a teammate, it's going to affect your team. It's going to hurt other people. So we don't want to miss it either way. We want to hit the center of the target with this. You got it? It's a big deal. One more thing before we receive communion. And that's this. Some people think they've surrendered when they haven't. I've seen people, I was trying to figure it out. Like I've surrendered my business to God, but it's not working. I've surrendered my family to God, but I don't know what's going on. I've surrendered my dreams to God. But when I observe them, they really haven't. And I was trying to figure it out because it was a little confusing to me because they were saying the right things, but then there was some other issues. So here's what happened. I think some people think they have surrendered, but they haven't. So let's say you you think you've surrendered your kids to God. You've surrendered your family. You know, like, Lord, I'm going to do what I know to do, but Lord, I'm I'm setting them before you. Please take care of my family. If you're treating your kids like garbage, You have not surrendered your family to Christ. You have to do what God would have you do in order to surrender your family to Christ. If you're treating your employees like garbage and you're being selfish, then you have not surrendered your business to Christ. To surrender your business to Christ means that you're going to live as a representative of Christ and you're going to do things God's way and you're going to trust God with that. So that's just something. Do it God's way. You haven't surrendered that thing yet. 
if you're not doing it God's way. Just saying you've surrendered, it doesn't do anything. So actually surrender your life, your family, your business, your dreams to God, and then live God's plan, and you can grab hold of the promise. All right, I want to finish with an old story. My uh, father-in-law told me this story for the first time years ago, and you can watch YouTube videos on this, and it, you know it's, it's a famous old story. Uh, and it's the wheelbarrow story. So one of my favorite old stories. I want to close with this because it really talks about finally, fully surrendering to God. And here's the picture. I got a guy named Bill. He's going on vacation setting maybe some years ago. And he goes to Niagara Falls. He's very excited to go to Niagara Falls. He hasn't seen it before. He wants to go. He's, on, he's by himself. So Bill is on vacation. And he saved up his money, and he's going to go see Niagara Falls. He gets there, and he's looking around. It's pretty awesome. He does see some stuff that he's not familiar with. You know, he sees this line going across from the one side to the other, and that looks like he's not sure what that's all about and different things going on. But he's very impressed with the the majesty and the power of the falls. And then uh, somebody says, hey, you know, uh, you got 25 cents. You can get on the viewing platform for the show. And Bill's like, what? It's like 25 cents is a guy going to walk the, the uh, Highline wire across Niagara Falls. You can watch it from over here for 25 cents. He's like, what? Like, yeah. They're like, okay. He puts in his quarter. He gets on the viewing platform. He's like, all right, well, that, that's amazing. I mean, I guess that's what that line was, you know, but it's all, it's got like water dripping off of it. It's right in the mist, you know, and it's just like, oof, duh. that's, that's kind of scary. And so then, uh, uh, Bob, our, uh, our Highline wire guy, he comes out, he waves to the crowd and uh, Bill is like, man, awesome. And Bob goes across, doesn't hesitate, walks across the Highline wire. Bill is very impressed. Bob isn't finished yet, waves to the crowd and he starts going backwards across Niagara Falls, walking backwards. He can't see the line. Bill is like, oh, he's going to die. But he makes it the whole way. And then Bill is like, wow, that was a great show. He's like, it's not over yet. And uh, Bob rolls a wheelbarrow out onto the Highline wire. And I don't know if you've ever done much uh, tightrope walking, but, um, you know, it's helpful to do this. But you got the wheelbarrow, you can't really do that. You know, it makes it more challenging. So he's got the wheelbarrow, he pushes it out, and Bill is like, he's going to die. But he makes it all the way across. And Bill is like, nice job. And then Bob waves to the crowd, and he starts walking backwards with the wheelbarrow. And Bill's like, there's no way he's making this. He, I mean, this is too much. He can't do it, but he makes it all the way back. He doesn't waver, nothing. He just walks all the way across, very successful, and he waves to the crowd. All right, show's over. You can come and uh, uh, get one of my books. I'll sign a book for you, buy a book. So <laughs> I'm adding that part. So, uh, so Bill is like, oh, man, that was so awesome. I got to go meet Bob. So he goes to the book signing, and he's like, Bob, that was so awesome. Hey, would you sign a book for me? And he's like, sure. You know, like to, to Bill, your greatest fan. You're like, hey, Bill. And he writes it in there. And, and Bob says, hey, do, you think, uh, do you think I could do it again? You know, I could go across the wire again? And Bill is like, well, yeah. I mean, don't you do this like for a living? You got a book. You know, like this would be a thing you could probably do pretty easily. He's like, are you sure? And Bill's like, well, well, yeah, I mean, you, you, I saw you go across, you went back, you took the wheelbarrow, you went back. I mean, you didn't even seem to hesitate. There was no wobbling. You, you seemed like you were in complete control the whole time. Yeah, I'm completely convinced you can do it again. And Bob says to Bill, he says, okay, well, if you're completely convinced I can do it again, go ahead and get in the wheelbarrow and let's go. And then that, of course, changes everything. It's one thing to see God from a distance and say, oh yeah, God's well able. It's another thing to actually put our faith that Jesus can take us to the other side, that we can get in the wheelbarrow, that we can relax, that we can trust that Jesus is going to get us to the other side, just like how Bill would have to trust Bob in the wheelbarrow to get him to the other side. And that's what fully surrendering to God is all about. That's what faith is all about. And so we're going to receive Holy Communion. Again, you are welcome to receive with me if you have uh, communion elements. 
If you would like to receive some elements like this, shoot me an email, pastormike at goodhope.ag. We'll get you some elements. But we're talking about fully surrendering to Jesus. And what better topic to receive communion over than that? Because we are, when we receive communion, we are honoring Jesus for what he did and we're pledging our faith to him. So that's what we want to do. So I'm going to pray, receive communion. I invite you to receive with me. And then I'll close in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for your great plan of redemption. You're not asking us to go first. You're not asking us to carry the load. You're asking us just to trust you, to carry us, to not run a different way, to not go flopping around in the wheelbarrow, so to speak, and throw things off, but just to relax and trust you. Help us, Lord, to seek you on what you would have us to do in our lives, fully surrendered, but not overshooting it, not going into places you never wanted us to be, not being like Peter and saying, my hands and my head as well, but Lord, just submitting to you and letting you wash our feet and then doing what you commanded your disciples to do to wash others' feet. And so, Lord Jesus, thank you that you sacrificed on the cross. Your blood was shed that we could be forgiven. Your body was broken that we could be healed. Lord, let us release ourselves to you by faith, trusting for that healing, trusting for that forgiveness, and trusting to be able to grab hold of a new life that is better than the life we leave behind. Let's receive Holy Communion together. This is the body of Christ, which was broken for you. And this is the blood of Christ, which was shed for you. Thank you, Lord Jesus, again for your sacrifice, for your mercy, and for your love. Help us to know we can fully trust you so that we can fully surrender and we can take hold of that life, which is truly life, that we can make the most of everything that you have for us. So Lord, help us to walk by faith, to love and encourage others, and to trust in you. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're so glad you are here for our digital broadcast. You can send a prayer request to our prayer team uh, by email, prayer at goodhope.ag, and that will get to our prayer teams and and uh, they will respond to that. But hey, you know, so glad you were here. From all of us at Good Hope, to you and yours, God bless. Have a wonderful day.